Good morning. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from Jesus Christ, our living Savior. We're so glad that you've joined us for this morning's worship service. Before we begin worship, there are just a couple of things I would like to lift up. First of all, we do want to um, share our sympathy and love for the family and friends of Margaret Sparrow and Jim Jokum. Both of these residents uh, did finish their courses on earth this past week and have gone on to be with the Lord. And so we pray that God will have mercy on their souls and certainly be with the family and friends of, of both of these fine people. We also celebrate and give thanks to God for the lives of some of our residents who will celebrate birthdays this week. Today is Bob Benrood's birthday, so happy birthday, Bob. Tomorrow, Lois Hamilton in the Wellness Center has a birthday. And then on Wednesday, Annie Aquino celebrates her birthday. And we certainly wish each of them a blessed day. Now let us prepare our hearts, our minds, and our spirits to worship God. obsessed with reality, your love is constant. Bless us now as we come to the one who offers us the bread of life, the promise of redemption, and the grace of forgiveness. Amen. I invite you to join together with me for our call to worship. Let us give thanks to the Lord with all our hearts. Greater are the works of our God. The wise take delight in them. 
The works of the Lord are faithful and just. Mighty are the precepts of our God. The wise regard them as trustworthy and true. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Blessed are the teachings of our God. The wise apply them to all things. Come, let us worship the Lord. His faithful love endures forever. And we open our time of worship by singing the hymn, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. Let's sing together. morning is Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will extol the Lord with all my heart in the counsel of the upright and in the assembly. Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. Glorious and majestic are his deeds and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wonders to be remembered the Lord is gracious and compassionate. He provides food for those who fear Him. He remembers His covenant forever. He has shown His people the power of His works, giving them the lands of other nations. The works of His hands are faithful and just. All His precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever, enacted in faithfulness and uprightness. He provided redemption for his people. He ordained his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Our second hymn for this worship service is Be Thou My Vision.
We do live in a time of considerable confusion. We ask today for your wisdom just as Solomon asked for wisdom. We're so often afraid. We live in a time of many dangers, of war and unrest throughout the world and different and competing interests that strive for our attention. And Lord, the pandemic rages on. Help us, O oh God, to pray for discerning and wise spirits, that you would guide our hearts and minds as we now pray aloud together the words of our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This morning, for the proclamation of the word, I'm referring to our Old Testament reading, which is 1 Kings chapter 2, verses 10 through 12, and then chapter 3, verses 3 through 14. And I want to include the New Testament epistle, which is Ephesians 5, 15 through 20. That sounds like a lot of scripture, but it's very valuable scripture. Then David lay down with his ancestors and was buried in David's city. He ruled over Israel 40 years, seven years in Hebron and 33 years in Jerusalem. Solomon sat on the throne of his father David and his royal power was well established. Now Solomon loved the Lord by walking in the laws of his father David with the exception that he also sacrificed and burned incense at the shrines. The king went to the great shrine at Gideon in order to sacrifice there. He used to offer a thousand entirely burned offerings on that altar. The Lord appeared to Solomon at Gideon in a dream at night. God said, ask whatever you wish and I'll give it to you. Solomon responded, you showed so much kindness to your servant, my father David, when he walked before you in truth, righteousness, and with a heart true to you. You've kept this great loyalty and kindness for him and have now given him a son to sit on his throne. And now, Lord my God, you have made me your servant, king in my father David's place. But I'm young and inexperienced. I know next to nothing. But I'm here, your servant, in the middle of the people you have chosen, a large population that can be numbered or counted due to its vast size. Please give your servant a discerning mind in order to govern your people and to distinguish good from evil. Because no one is able to govern this important people of yours without your help. It pleased the Lord that Solomon had made this request. God said to him, Because you have asked for this instead of requesting long life, wealth, or victory over your enemies, asking for discernment so as to acquire good judgment, I will now do just what you said. Look, I hereby give you a wise and understanding mind. There has been no one like you before now, nor will there be anyone like you afterward. I now also give you what you didn't ask for, wealth and fame. There won't be a king like you as long as you live. And if you walk in my ways and obey my laws and commands, just as your father David did, then I will give you a very long life. And now the words that Paul wrote to the Ephesians, so be careful to live your life wisely, not foolishly. Take advantage of every opportunity because these are evil times. Because of this, don't be ignorant 
but understand the Lord's will. Don't get drunk on wine, which produces depravity. Instead, be filled with the Spirit in the following ways. Speak to each other with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music to the Lord in your hearts. Always give thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord, Jesus Christ. May God bless the reading and the hearing of his holy word. Amen. Well, our Old Testament scripture lesson brings an end to David's reign. <clears throat> and in just three short verses, the succession is accomplished. And David sleeps with his ancestors and is buried in the city of David. The last years of his life, David is so old that he just can't get warm. They cover him with clothes, but he doesn't get warm. I imagine David shivers in the knowledge of all that his life has taught him, much of it the hard way. At the end of his life, David shivers in the knowledge that it is the fear of the Lord that's the beginning of wisdom. Then Nathan and Bathsheba come to him and they come to remind David of the promise for Solomon to succeed him. Yes, David thinks to himself, shivering under this pile of covers. Yes, that, that's the covenant, the promise. God is with me still. God forgives my indiscretion and my downfall. God has left me with Solomon. Maybe David warms just a little with the recognition that the son from his love of Bathsheba, Solomon, is his successor. Finally, David is calmed and warmed, and as his time to die draws near, he calls Solomon to come to him. Solomon, my son, I want to sum up for you what I know now that you're beginning your reign. What, looking back over my long life and reign, has taught me. You know, hindsight is good vision. What looking back over my long life reveals to me, my son, is that fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. David's calm as he shares what he knows. Be strong, my son Solomon, and keep the charge of the Lord your God, walking in God's ways, keeping God's statutes, and as it's written in the law, that you, that you, my dear son, may prosper. And then David sleeps with his ancestors. And he's married, and Solomon sits on the throne. The succession is complete. Now, we move over to uh, chapter 3. In the second portion of the scripture from Kings for this Sunday, formalized Solomon's succession, if you will, to the throne. We find that Solomon goes to Gideon to make a sacrifice, as was the custom. And it's here that the Lord appears to Solomon in a dream, and, and God asks him, what, what shall I give you? And Solomon answers immediately, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because David walked before you in faithfulness and righteousness and uprightness of heart. And now, O oh God, I am in the place of David, and I am depending on you. I'm only a little child. <laughs> or at least it seems like that all of a sudden. And, and I don't even know if I'm coming or going. And, and besides, you know, I only got to the throne by the skin of my teeth. I only got here because all the other brothers knocked each other off. And I was the only one left standing. Well, there was Adonijah, who was exalted, but not for long. Then there's a subject of my mother, Bathsheba. <laughs> she is rather infamous and not always admired. And there's the matter of the people of Israel. You've chosen for me to lead. Lord, there's so many of them. You couldn't count them if you wanted to. Who? Who in this world could govern them? I need help, God. I'm scared to death. You ask what you can give me? Well, let's begin with an understanding mind to govern your people and have an ability to discern good from evil. And it's right here, at the very beginning of the reign, that Solomon demonstrates his knowledge 
that fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And never again will Israel know such security, peace, well-being, affluence as they do under Solomon's reign. All 40 years of it. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, of peace, of well-being. But I think we should stop here for a second and lift up that word fear because it can be confusing at best when people read it. Fear of the Lord. Especially in scripture, fear of the Lord can also mean the fear, awe, and respect we as human beings have of the Lord and the relationship we have with Him. And that is exactly what Solomon understands in this way. He calls himself a servant of the Lord four times during this dream. And when God asks him, what shall I give you? Solomon answers, an understanding mind and the ability to discern good from evil. This request is literally for a hearing heart. You see, back at this time in ancient history, the heart was considered the center of the self and the center of the soul. The heart was the place of thinking and feeling. The heart was the place for discipline and will. Solomon's request implies the desire for a reason that understands. A heart with the skill to listen, the ability to judge, an instinct for integrity, and it does please the Lord that Solomon has asked it. The Lord grants what Solomon asks and adds to it. How does he add to it? Well, it helps us to understand that the Hebrew word for wisdom, hakma, defines wisdom in three different ways. All three will now be granted to Solomon. First and foremost, wisdom, hakma, is the capacity to discern, to reason, especially good from evil. And it's the ability to make good judgments. Didn't Solomon demonstrate this capacity soon after his dream? Yes, two harlots come before him, both claiming to be the mother of one little baby. Solomon calls for a sword, planning to give one half of the baby to each woman. But the true mother responds, oh no, don't kill that baby. Just give her to the other woman. But the other heart says, I divide it. Solomon returns the child to his true mother. And all Israel heard of the judgment, Hakma, which the king rendered. They stood in awe of the king because they perceived the wisdom of God was in him to render justice. Wisdom, hakma, the capacity to discern good from evil, the ability to judge. And then the second meaning of wisdom, hakma, is more like you think of people that have memorized the encyclopedia. It's knowledge that can be used in practical matters. Wisdom is the knowledge of facts, but also the power to use that knowledge well and the skill. Solomon's wisdom in this matter was so wide and so deep that almost any spoken bit of wisdom from a clever proverb to a deep truth has been attributed to Solomon all over the generations. But finally, wisdom, hakma, is also a secular asset, a kind of savoir-faire, if you will, a sophistication savvy. This aspect of wisdom, Solomon has in good measure as well. His knowledge and capacity to discern, his savvy, are all used to build Jerusalem's temple and Solomon's palace. Solomon designed courtyards and paths through Jerusalem. This particular aspect of wisdom reflects Solomon in all his glory. God is pleased with Solomon for making this request. And God said to Solomon, because you have asked this and have not asked for long life or riches or the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, behold, I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind so that none like you has been before. I give you also what you have not asked riches and honor. 
And if you walk in my ways, keep my statutes and my commandments, then I will give you a long life. And at that point, we might all say, well, you know, that's a pretty good story. And it's even one that we probably should use for our own good. But it really is from way back in those ancient days. Why, it was long, long before Jesus even walked the earth. And so we're blessed by the reading of the epistle to the Ephesians. Be careful then, writes Paul, how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise. Paul intends for us to be careful that our faith isn't separated from our lives. This idea that faith is an intellectual exercise about the thoughts we have, the beliefs we hold, and not really about how we live, well, that was like a curse to Paul. He taught that it was absurd that our way of living wouldn't be shaped by how we believe and by our faith. So be careful how you live, he says. Let your life bear witness to your faith, giving thanks at all times and for everything. And that wasn't just a lesson in etiquette, good advice for getting along with people and serving God. This is a core lesson of discipleship. Gratitude is a condition of the heart and the driver for all sorts of action, ministry, and service. Gratitude is the foundation of discipleship. It requires an awareness of our need for grace and an appreciation of the source of that blessing. It's because of our overwhelming gratitude toward God that we can also begin to appreciate one another and indeed all of creation. A part of that gift and a reminder of God's presence. Giving thanks is behind or underneath our journey of faith. It drives stewardship and mission. It brings us faithfully to worship every week, whether it's in a sanctuary or whether it's gathered in front of a piece of technology. It drives us to our knees in devotion and prayer. It opens the living word of God as we explore the scriptures. Gratitude. It's the best motivator for evangelism. You see, we tell the story because we're grateful for God's activity in our lives. Giving thanks at all times and for everything. It's a powerful way to live. It's a wise way to live. And I think it's gratitude that ties and unites God's people. Solomon was grateful for the faith of his father David and for God's provision for David and his reign. And so he prayed, give me an understanding heart. Isn't that the kind of prayer God delights in answering? That's the kind of person Solomon was and God was ready and willing to work through him. The fame and fortune God bestowed on Solomon was an indication that God wanted him to do well. And it seemed like the better Solomon did, the more God was glorified. Here's an example you may well remember. It's found in 1 Kings 10. It says that when the queen of Sheba beheld Solomon's wisdom and all of his wealth, she went away. How? Praising the God of Israel. The writers of both Kings and Chronicles presented Solomon's fame and fortune as a glorious testimony to the faithfulness of God in keeping God's promises. The blessings of God, both spiritual and material, are given to us that they may be passed on to others through us. We're wise to remember this principle when we pray. James teaches us that selfish prayers are largely ineffective. Moreover, our prayers reveal our priorities. We naturally pray for things that are the most important to us. Solomon's prayer for wisdom certainly demonstrated that God's priorities were his priorities. 
And God wanted a wise leader to guide his people and more than anything else in the world, Solomon wanted to be that wise leader. Leaders like Solomon make great kings and, and great ministers because they are great servants. The desire for wisdom is the first step toward true greatness. May we be wise enough to see wisdom. And may God grant us the wisdom to want most what his people need the most. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our hymn of dedication for this service is Take Time to Be Holy. Let's sing. Receive now this benediction. Go forth into the world, trusting with your hearts the wisdom God bestows upon all who seek to follow his wisdom. When called to lead, do so with humility and confidence in God. Be in this world a sign of Jesus' presence. Share compassion with all whom you encounter. Live wisely in God's name and glorify God in all you do. And may the grace, mercy, and wisdom of God be your support, guidance, and strength from this day forward, now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>